Biden, capital B U Y, capital I T, capital N O W, exclamation point. Because you're excited. Uh, my name is Nima Sarshar. I'm an Intuit. I've been there for a year. Before that, uh, I founded a startup that uh, that did not go anywhere. Before that, as I, I was a university professor. So, uh, um, would I try to um, just just so you know the graphs? I mean, I mean, I've been interested in graphs. I mean, that's been my my research. Um, it's been mostly what I've been doing. I mean, different things of about the graph since like 2001, when it was P2P networks, you would search P2P graphs and stuff like that. The work I'm sort of proud of, uh, so proceeding a National Academy of Science did the mistake of putting my work on the, on the cover. I'm gonna show this forever. <laughs> <laughs> so, and Intuit is uh, probably an interesting choice for a graph problem, uh, and I'll tell you um, uh, at the end how that goes, but we've got a lot of Different products, some of which you know more than than the others, the TurboTax, uh, the GoPayment, Mint. Um, so there's a lot, there's a ton of different products, and lately we've started connecting them together. So the users of different products, we now have a bigger view of how uh, users across different products are interacting with each other, and mainly that's where the graph and Intuit comes from. Um, one one version of it is we call it the commercial graph. Basically, think of uh, think of uh, social network, but for businesses, right? A business A does business with business B, they got a client C that's working with both of them, so you end up basically having a graph where the nodes are actual commercial entities and the links are transactions be between those commercial entities, right? Um, now what I'm trying to do mostly for this talk is, uh, you know, I've, I've been writing MapReduce codes for, for, um, for graph algorithms since say 2008, 2009 when I was working in the startup. Um, and we were kind of early adopters of that. But then, it's one of those things you, you got really excited about, you know, well, you know, I could run stuff on 200 machines, right? So that's cool. But then, uh, I mean, if, if any of you kind of do start working a little bit with, uh, with MapReduce, there comes a point where you say, is there something really fundamentally interesting there? Or is it just convenient paradigm for computing, right? Um, so, so you, there is that thing, and I've seen a lot of people who, who would have that feeling. So, so as a computer scientist, uh, is there anything algorithmically interesting there, right? And for me, about the graphs and working with graphs and, uh, and whatnot, what I really hope to, that you take from this is that there is something there, right? It's taken a little bit of a while for some of the more interesting stuff to come up, but there's some active research going on. I mean, it's been, it's been spotty and, uh, you know, but, but there is some interesting, exciting problems that really require you to do good old uh, computer science to solve, right? And if you take that from this talk, that's, uh, that's perfect. Anything else? Uh, um, so I'll just give you, so I wouldn't, rather than doing a big laundry list of solve problems, I'll walk you through some really specific ones. Hopefully you'll enjoy the, the, the tricks behind them, I think, and get, would get you thinking. Um, but then I also want to uh, have an ulterior motive. So uh, we're building this package uh, at Intuit. Uh, so I hopefully convince you that it's a good idea to just put it all into one uh, under one roof. Uh, I mean, with everything else that's going on about graph processing, you know, the Priggle and the Giraffe and whatnot, I think Hadoop still kind of just map reduce in its pure form still is a, is a pretty powerful tool. So I'll convince you hopefully of that, and then you get a, to know a little bit about Intuit um, and why why I'm excited. Uh, about working there. So, so basically the plan would be I'll just jump right into it. Uh, I'll give you one example, which is kind of a, kind of an old example. How do I find all the triangles in a really big graph, right? And how do I do it efficiently? And what happens if I don't think right into it? Uh, so that would be a good example to just open up. Then I'll just walk you through. So what is it that when we say good algorithm, right? What's a good algorithm? Uh, so what are the metrics we're trying to optimize? So if you're really a uh, MapReduce programmer, uh, uh, you'll quickly recognize them, but hopefully, uh, if not, you'll get an idea of uh, when we say good algorithm versus bad algorithm, or, or a naive algorithm, what we mean by that. Um, then there's a couple of recipes out there uh, for doing, doing things in general with graphs and MapReduce, right? Uh, it's not really recipe, recipe, but there's two classes of things at least, or maybe even, even more. I'll just get you to know what are those classes uh, and what problems you would solve under each of those. Um, 
I'll read you the triangle finding example using one of those recipes, and I'll do personalized page rank uh, under the other recipe, right? And, uh, and then maybe we'll chat a little bit about uh, the other algorithms that we could do. Um, uh. So here's one, one example. Um, so I've, I've been given this little graph and I've been asked to find all the triangles in this graph. And there's only one triangle, right? Two, three, four, right? Uh, and I've been told to do it in MapReduce, right? So just, just so the connection to streaming algorithms is, uh, is, is explicit, you usually have, you receive the graph as a, the data structure that you get. It's basically you get them all edge by edge, right? It's if, you, if it's a sparse enough graph, it really makes sense to have one record for each edge, right? And then in the mapper, and Basically, you would, the mappers would receive one uh, one edge at a time, right? So these are basically I stacked up all the all the edges uh, of that graph there. So there's three, four, two, four, two, three, one, three, and it's an undirected graph. So I'll have only one record for each edge, right? So each of those basically goes one by one through the mapper, right? Now I want to find uh, I want to find all the triangles, but triangle to find a triangle when I'm receiving one edge at a time, so there's no global view for a node of its neighbors, right? So to find a triangle, you like a node like three, needs to at least have some sort of a visibility in its uh, neighborhood, right? But if I'm getting the net edges one by one, the first thing I probably want to do is for every node to gather all its neighbors around one bucket, right? So basically, the uh, then I would the way you would do it in MapReduce is uh, uh, sorry, I don't think I will have. Hopefully it would be clear even if you don't write MapReduce jobs, but you could key key elements under, uh, so there's a key and a value, right? So basically you receive an edge and you would key it under each of its nodes once. So it would look like something like this. You receive the first edge, you would key it under node four once. So this would be one bucket, this would be one bucket. So the node four uh, would be the key for that bucket and the node three for the edge four three would be the other element, the value that would be associated with that key. So there would be a key four and a value three. And this is the bucket for node four, right? There would be one bucket for node three, uh, and I receive node four in the bucket as the value. And remember, this is an undirected edge, so I'm keying it under either node once, right? So there would be two buckets so far. And I keep doing that for, um, for, uh, for all the other elements, right? There's node two, four. So I already had a bucket for four, so the two comes under that, and then there's a bucket for two, new bucket for two, where the node four comes under that, right? And I keep doing that one edge at a time. So that way, at least I, uh, for every, in each bucket, the center node basically has access to its neighbors, right? At least I have some, uh, collected things under each node, the neighbors under each node. The next thing is that, well, I wouldn't know, so, so, so this center node, and any pair of its neighbors could potentially be a triangle, right? But at least at this level, we don't know, right? At least at this level, all we know is that node three has neighbors one, two, and four, right? That's all we know. But is there really a triangle? No, it really depends on whether any of those edges actually exist, right? Um, so really the only edge that exists for, say, let's say node three, the only edge that exists that creates a triangle is between two and four, right? So since there is an actual edge between two and four exists, then three, two, and four is the triangle, right? But an actual edge between three, between one and two does not exist, right? Then three, one, two is not a triangle, but we would not know it at this moment, right? All we have to do is to enumerate all potential triangles at this stage, and then we would run another map reduce job, we would, which would check whether that edge actually exists or not, right? So how many potential triangles are there? Right? So every so a node and every pair of its neighbors is a potential triangle, so far as we know at this moment, right? So, um, so this is one potential triangle, this is another potential triangle, this is another potential triangle. So as far as the node three is concerned, there could be three triangles, right? We enumerate those. And as far as node four is concerned, there's one, node two, there's one, right? And then in the next run, basically, we'll, we'll check whether any of those edges actually exist. So, when, um, so what's the problem with this? So in this example, there's four potential triangles that I have to, in the next MapReduce job, I have to check whether the corresponding edge actually exists. And then each triangle is really detected three times, right? 
under every single node, I'll find that triangle once. I have to run another job to reconcile the triangles. So, so first thing is, well, you know, I find I find every single triangle three times, which is not good. But that's really not the worst of my problems. It's really that I'll be creating way too many intermediate potential triangles. And I'll tell you why. I mean, think of a node that has degree D. Uh, that means it has D neighbors. I'll be creating D choose two order of D squared potential triangles, right? And, it, and if you have, all it takes is one really high degree node to, I mean, if a node has degree 100,000, then, then we're done, right? Um, thing is like an Intuit, Intuit does business with everybody. So in our graph, Intuit is connected with everybody. So um, for the most part, we have a lot of people. And then all of a sudden, you know, that doesn't work. I mean, the, the, the simple trick is to just remove those high degree nodes uh, that would create the, the square problem and then run the same thing, which is what, what people used to do. But I never like, you know, what is a high degree node, right? Uh, so it's, a, it's kind of an artificial fix. You could do, you could do better, I'll show you how. Um, just so we get this right, that, that is straightforward implementation. If I ask you how many intermediate triangles did I create, you could do the math and it will be n times the variance of the degree distribution. So, so if the graph has a degree distribution, uh, that means that I pick a node at random, what's the probability that that node has degree k? Let's call that pk. So it, it, it defines a distribution. So what is the variance of that degree distribution? The number, the total number of potential triangles you would create would be n times that variance. And then as we know, a lot of real world networks, so like all the social graphs and all, are really heavy tailed. That means there's a bunch of nodes that, that are really well connected and then the variance to mean ratio is really high. That's like a hallmark of a lot of these things. I mean, whether it's power law, you want to call it or not, I mean, they're, they're definitely heavy tailed. Okay. So how do I get away with this? So I'll show you just, uh, just slightly modified tricks. So let's, let's take the same thing. I'll just do one very simple um, very simple change to this algorithm. Instead of keying it under both end nodes, I only key it under the node with the smaller lexicographic number, right? However you want to just uh, sort your nodes, or call them one, two, three, however you want them. Don't, don't key them under both, both nodes. You really don't need to do that, why? So do it under only three. Then don't do it under four, because uh, three is smaller than four. And then keep doing that for all the the other edges. Then uh, there would be only one potential triangle. And my claim is, you'll find all triangles this way. Or if a triangle exists, it would be detected under the bucket of its the smallest number node. And you can take a moment to convince yourself it's pretty straightforward. There would still be a lot of um, potential triangles that do not exist. But if it does exist, it's going to show up exactly once under the low degree node. The, Sorry, the lowest um, lowest number node. Okay. So that's okay, that's neat. I mean, a very very super simple trick, right? I'm not claiming any of these or, uh, or anything. But at least not, you know, I have to only check one triangle. So that's an improvement. But it really doesn't solve the doesn't solve the uh, the quadratic problem, right? It's still um, still you know it's a third less, but but it's still a lot, right? Um, but then, what is, really, what is it really that we're trying to avoid, right? We don't want buckets whose center node is a really high degree node. That's what we're trying to avoid, really, right? Because when a, when a node has degree D in a bucket, then there would be D choose two potential triangles. We want to cut down on those. We don't want buckets whose center node is super high degree. And it's simple to avoid that, because the numbering, the ordering of the nodes is pretty arbitrary, right? So I could actually order the nodes, I define an ordering of the node based on their degree. So I'll call the node lower if its degree is lower. Versus, um, that's a very simple trick. So the way I number the nodes is basically depending on their degree. And if two nodes have equal degree, then break the tie arbitrarily, but consistently. So each node has an ID to begin with, like we had. Uh, but first sort them by, you know, give them an ID based on their degree. So it needs one map reduce job or one, one pre-processing to re rename the nodes. But once you do that, then, then something interesting happens. 
So you just key them under the low degree node. So what it avoids is that most of the time when, when there comes an edge, one end of which is really high degree, the other end is low degree, you would tend to tend to key it under the low degree node. You avoid sending edges to a bucket where the center is high degree. And then if you do them, so, so I just changed that example just a little bit. Suppose you had something like this, where this node was used to be called node one, and it had four neighbors. So for that bucket for node one, you would be creating four, choose two, four different potential triangles. But if I just relabel them so that the node with the lowest degree has the lower um, has the lower number. I just re renumbered them. We call this one. We call this two, three, four. And this guy that had the highest degree, I gave them the, the largest number. So nothing would ever get keyed under five. Uh, one edge would get keyed under one. There's only one thing. There would be no potential triangles. No potential triangles for this. And there would be uh, four. Basically, would only have five. There would be nothing. And then only three would have two neighbors. So I'll be cutting it down basically from four to, to just one. So if you do the little bit of a math, you could show that it actually makes a, makes a real difference. Um, so for one on the worst case side, you could show that if you have M edges, the worst case number of potential triangles you would create for this is M to the power three over two versus M to the power two if you do the naive way, right? But really in, the, in reality, what you get is, is usually a lot, a lot better. And the reason is that another thing you can show that if the graph is random, you actually cut down from n times the variance of the degree distribution all the way to n times the average degree squared. For instance, in our graph, the variance is in millions. Uh, the average degree is in hundred. Uh, so, so I'm cutting it down from a million down to tens of thousands. So, so really, in reality, uh, for graphs that are more or less random-like, right? Uh, you're going to get a huge difference. Um, I mean, it really makes a difference. So that, that's just uh, simple. I mean, as you can imagine, just pick something that's, uh, that kind of gets the point across. And feel free to stop me. And if you pick that example, I'll be happy. Uh, I mean, unless your job is uh, writing MapReduce stuff for graphs, then you're bored. But uh, other than that, hopefully, uh, hopefully that gets the point across. And why would you care about triangles? We care about triangles because we find clicks of things, right? We want, uh, it is basically a measure of how clustered a community of nodes is. How many, if I have a lot of triangles between my neighborhoods, that means that there's a, a lot of my neighbors are basically connected to each other. Um, and you may want to do that for a, you know, I'm not gonna convince you. But, um, but you could generalize this, and that's a beautiful thing, from a triangle to a, to a rectangle. So it's a similar trick, but it needs a little bit of a, of a more interesting uh, um, consideration. Because the, the triangle, one good thing about it is that there's only one ordering of a triangle. Within a flipping and, you know, within rotation and flipping, there's only one way you order nodes in a triangle. The smallest one, the next smallest one, the, the largest one. You could always traverse it that way. But for a, for a rectangle, there's actually three equivalency classes on how you would traverse it from the smallest node. So as you go across, the, across the, the rectangle. So within a flipping and rotation, there are three equivalency classes. But nonetheless, you could write it and you could, you could actually do a pretty good job for, for a rectangle as well. But I'll just leave it at that. So, so what are the stuff that, that we optimize for? Um, I mean, obviously, it's the total computation that we optimize. Obviously, in the mappers and in the reducers and in all the computations you do, you want to do as, as little as, as you have to. But, uh, but there is, so that's called computation. But the communication is another term that people use when they, when they analyze um, uh, performance of map reduce jobs. It's how many records do we send, send from the mapper to the reducer. Um, that's another metric of, uh, how many. So that's why when I created all those um, those intermediate triangles, there would be next round of map reduce job that would take each of those records and check for an edge to exist. So th all those things should be sent from a mapper to a reducer. So the communication and computation of that other job uh, was was what we were trying to trying to minimize. Um, uh, and then the the other thing that's kind of 
you can either work it out into the math for the computation and communication, or, or on its own as an interesting thing, is basically how many rounds of computation do you have to do? And as you know, I mean, sometimes it's costly to, to do, you know, you know, if you have a ton of MapReduce jobs that has to be set up and, you know, back and forth, written to the disk. Uh, so that, that has an overhead. Um, so, so you usually don't want to do too many, too many rounds. So these are the three things uh, that, that people do, do optimize for. Um, so those sounded okay, but they sounded like we got lucky with, with a trick. Um, so and of course, uh, computer scientists that we are, we want to find a formula, we want to find a recipe, right? Um, so, and there is, uh, to be honest, there's none that really convinces me, but there are two, two major tricks. One is, um, one is to basically divide the, the, this big graph into smaller ones where you, w that fits into memory and use like a serial in memory algorithm to, to do some computation and in future rounds basically merge the results of the computations. I mean, it sounds like, what do we call it? I mean, I don't know, divide and conquer or whatever. It's, it's some version of that, right? Uh, but, um, so there's a, there's a bunch of algorithms that go that way. There's the other bunch which uses this whole parallel nature that we could do computations in parallel, and then at some point we keep merging them together. I'll give you one quick example of each, um, but then there are, there are a few few more tricks. But but these are the two classes where there the most algorithms are under. Um, I'll just do the same the same triangle finding, but with a with a slight twist, uh, with a slight diff slightly different um, different trick. So the trick is this: Why don't I? So I've got this big graph. Why don't I partition the nodes in the graph into B sets? So I have B different sets that partition the, partition the set of my nodes. So I preset that thing, maybe using a hash function, I'll know every node ID, which of these B buckets it would belong to, which of these B sets it would belong to. Then when I receive an edge, I would send that edge to all the, so it, for, for every three, three, such sets, I'll create a bucket. Um, so if I have i, j, k, where i is less than j, less than k, for every three subset of those, uh, those partition sets, I'll create a bucket. Now when I receive an edge, I'll send it to a bucket where both ends of that edge is, uh, is, is, is basically a member of that bucket. So there would be more than one bucket that the same edge would be sent to. So I'll just give you this uh, quick example. Same example. Um, I have, I have uh, three, basically uh, I have a node with four, or a graph with four nodes, and I have B equals to four, at the top I'm writing that now. So B equals to four, uh, it's basically a kind of a trivial partitioning of the nodes. The, the set one has only node one, all the way to set four has only node four. Then every three member of this, I, J, K, where I is less than J, less than K, will give you a bucket, therefore there's three buckets. Bucket one, two, three, bucket, bucket one, three, four, and two, four, two, three, four. So every edge that I receive, I'll basically send it to the bucket where, uh, where both ends of the node, that, that edge actually are part of that bucket, right? So this one goes, it would be replicated, there would be, it would, it would belong to more than one bucket. And the next one, and the next one, and the next one. Um, and then, Hopefully, I could. The idea is that I pick B large enough so that these partitions would become small enough that they would fit in a memory, and I'll use a, a good triangle in memory triangle finding algorithm to find all the triangles there. Um, and as you may agree with me, all triangles will be found because uh, all the three nodes would be at least in one bucket. Um, but it's like something that kind of is cool is that if you do the math, um, you may not look at the same, you know, at the first glance. Uh, there is, a, there is, by the way, a serial, um, if you have m edges, there is a, the best in-memory algorithm also has m to the power 3 over 2, worst case uh, uh, performance. So if you use that algorithm, it turns out that if you take b to be square root of m, you'll get the same performance as we're getting from our trick uh, early on earlier on. So if you pick B large enough, in this case, square root of M, you'll have M to the power 3 over 2 communication, M to the power 3 over 2 computation. So it would work as if it was the best algorithm that was out there. There's a little bit of a problem with this uh, that I'll spare you, and that's uh, 
triangles would be detected more than once. But there is a simple trick, very similar to how we um, how we ordered the nodes in the first example, to just uh, just fix that one. So, but this is like a classic. I mean, it's a simple example of so you partition it. But you partition it smartly so that what you're looking for, you can at least find it somewhere. But then you merge the results, um, you know, maybe in a, in, a, in the next round or 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 some other some other means. Um, another good example of it is a minimum minimum weight spanning tree. So suppose you have a graph that's pretty dense and you want to find the minimum weight spanning tree. Um, what you could do is that you could um, again partition the nodes into B buckets. But for every pair of those those um, sets, create a bucket and send all the edges that are part of that bucket to the corresponding bucket, and run the minimum spanning tree weight spanning tree finding just on that bucket. Uh, remove all the edges that are not part of the spanning tree. Basically, you're sparsifying the graph. So sparsification is a, I mean, is a, is a known trick, right? So I mean, you re realize that a lot of these things are basically um, recompiling known tricks, either in the streaming world. Or just you know, or in the general sense of things. Um, so that's another good example. So you basically partition it, fits in memory, run your minimum weight spanning tree, sparsify the graph, and, and repeat. Right. Um, the other thing is, um, and I, this is my one of my favorite examples. Um, so the other thing is, okay, so far um, those algorithms were pretty local. If you agree with me, it's like a triangle is really local. So, so therefore, the computations are really local. Uh, but, but, but there are a lot of things that are not that local. Let's say personalized page rank. Now, if you have a global page rank, that was one of the reasons I think Google built MapReduce uh, to just be able to streamline computing page rank. But, but once you have Hadoop and once you have MapReduce, it takes like really 20 line of code to write some page rank. But um, so there's not much of that's what I meant that some of these things are easy to port to MapReduce. Um, you know, you just write a, a bunch of MapReduce jobs that, that does the job. But, but think of uh, personalized page rank. Personalized page rank is just like page rank, global page rank. So someone a, a surfer starts from a node, does a bunch of random walks, but instead of teleporting to a randomly selected node, it would go back to where it started. So um, so th therefore, for every node, and then the, the quantity we compute is the frequency of the visits to the nodes that for this random walker. So the random walker starts a bunch of nodes, bunch of random walks, then it goes back to where it started, repeats that many times. So there will be a vector of frequencies attached to that particular node. So for every node in the graph, there will be a vector of frequencies. That means if a random walker started from that particular node, what's the probability that, you know, what's, what's the distribution of the frequency of the nodes that it's going to visit, right? That's, that's, uh, that's the personalized version of, why would you do that? It's like a measure of how, what's around the neighborhood of a given node. Who's who around me, not globally. Um, now, but that, as you can imagine, might be a costly thing. I mean, I have to run, if I want to simulate that random walk, and if I have to do it for every single node, that may end up being a pretty costly thing. Um, so to compute that or to approximate that, we may do Monte Carlo approximation. For every single node, we start map reduce jobs. Um, every map reduce job would simulate one step of a random walk for each of those nodes, for a random walker starting from each of those nodes. So if I want to simulate a random walk of length t, I'll have to run <coughs> jobs. But I could do that simultaneously for all the nodes. So there would be one random walker starting from every single node. I'll run t map reduce jobs to simulate the walk of length t. And that's fine. Um, but my claim is that you could do, we could do better. So we have to redo that many, many times and then get an approximation of the, the the local page rank or the personalized page rank for every node. So, so, we, so then the problem we're trying to solve is to simulate a random walk of length t without having to do t map reduce jobs. Because if t is large, it's 100 or 200, then we get into trouble. Okay. Now, so here's the trick, and this is kind of the gist of a lot of these um, doing parallel then stitch together tricks. 
So instead of doing a map, uh, T map, uh, map reduce jobs to, to simulate a walk of length T, I'll do walks of uh, T square root of T, right? But I'll do it do it a bunch of times. So I pick a uh, um, so I want to oh, sorry I want to tell you how I can cut that down to square root of T map reduce jobs instead of T. So pick a pick a number J, right? Um, instead of doing a random walk of length T, do T over J random walks from every node for some J for some integer J. Instead of doing one big, big walk, do basically a lot of smaller walks, okay? But do it from from every node many times. Right? To form a uh, form a walk of length t, basically pick one of the t over j uh, segments at a random node. Then whatever it is the end node of that walk, pick another walk from that node, and then stitch it together. So to form a length t walk. I basically pick a t over j walk, then I come end up at some node. I mean, there's some node at the end of that walk. And then that node has a bunch of other random walks of t over j that it has done. Then I'll pick one of those at random, and I stitch these two together. Then it would take me to the, to the third node, and that node has t over j. So I do that j times, and then I'll get basically a walk of length t. So if I do j walks of length t over j starting from every single node, then I, I, I never run out. Basically, the trick is that I don't want to pick the same, the same, the same segment twice for the same walk. So it, the, the fact that I may come back to this node during the same walk, I need another fresh segment. That's why I need j different, j different walks. So j different walks of length t over j from every single node. So the total number of walks that I'll be doing is j with, with sorry, map reduce jobs to simulate that would be j plus t over j. And, for, and that would be minimized when j is square root of t. That would, uh, that would require basically square root of t uh, uh, rounds of map reduce to simulate walks of length t for every single node. Oh. So that's a, but then you could even do exponentially better than this, and I'm not gonna bother you with this. This is like a serial stitching. You could do a recursive stitching, which basically exponentially speeds up the, the, speech, this, uh, the stitching rate, right? Right now, I just stitch one segment at a time. You could just write a recursive way of basically stitching things uh, on a longer st uh, stitches. Um, so I'm not gonna go over that. So, so there's, there's this whole thing again on, um, on, uh, on labeling connected components. It's like, again, that's a global problem. You have a bunch of connected components, so it's basically another global view of the of the graph is required. Now you could try to simulate what we do on a single machine. You know, have a stack, take a node, color its neighbors, put them in the stack, pick the nodes. Uh, you know, you could do basically essentially the similar thing, but you could do also a fair bit better. I'm not going to go through the example, but you could do a fair bit better. Um, in uh, and some of the better results I've seen past. And as you might imagine, I mean, these are like November to 2012. So, so there's still fresh thinking going on in these, in these. So you could basically find all the connected components with n plus n communication and log n, uh, n being the number of nodes, um, regardless of the diameter of the graph. Even, even for, for a very degenerate path-like graph, uh, you'll have log n um, rounds. I mean, it's easy to do log d, uh, sorry, it's easy to do d rounds, where d is the diameter of the graph. But if you're kind of smart, you could cut it down to log in, regardless of how, how long your graph is. Um, so that's another set of things. Um, maybe I'll stop here before I kind of move forward. So in your random walk, if you're stitching mm -hmm. them together, mm -hmm. then you're not worrying as much about fully exploring the space. You know, once you've found you know, A, da 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 to B, B, da 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 to Z, and you stitch those together, you know, you're not doing some of the other local search, but you're saying that's okay. No, no, we have to repeat that many times, though. Okay. Yeah. So that's just one walk of length T. You still need to do many walks of length T and do, uh, do the frequency of visit analysis. So if you do many walks, it's just like another run. And another run different the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's okay. different. So the, the only thing to remember is that these walks from different nodes are, are actually highly correlated. They're not independent. The walk that I do from, from my node 
and the walk that my neighbor does are very correlated because we're reusing the, the right. station. But as far, so, so, so these walks are absolutely not independent. But as far as computing the page rank is concerned, it doesn't matter. What it matters is that the walk is starting from me as a single node is a pure real walk, which it is. But it's very correlated with, with the walk that my neighbor does. But as far as computing the page rank goes, that doesn't matter. Right? And that's all the beauty of that thing. Um, that, uh, that the walks are really correlated. That's we're reusing the walk. But, um, but it doesn't matter uh, you know, as far as this is concerned. But you have to repeat the walk many times to get, a, to get an approximation of the page rank. Uh, Yes. Yeah, that, this uh, stitching idea is very interesting because yeah. this is uh, I because the Monte Carlo path tracing, which mm -hmm. is the rent for rendering, mm -hmm. it uses an algorithm very similar as far as reusing paths and uh, controlling the mutation uh, probabilities. Huh. But uh, but this last problem, is, I know you didn't have time. Yeah. Can you give me a hint? Is it do you use path compression to to find? Are you talking about the labels? Yeah, so, so it's very much like a, it has a min hash idea type of trick. So basically, I could quickly show you what, what the, the straightforward way of doing it is, which you basically it's like you generalize that. So how how do we do it in one one machine? Right. So you, well, basically, you pick a node, you just color its neighbors, put them in a stack, then you pop the neighbors from the stack, you color their neighbors. You need to keep a keep a flag that says, "Have I popped you from the thing?" Stack, so I wouldn't put you back, but that's very straightforward kind of second grade uh, way of doing it. But you could you could parallelize this uh, to in MapReduce. You don't want to you don't want to start from. So let's say there's a thousand connected components in one single memory. You you you, you label them one at a time, right? You pick a random node, you know, color its neighbors until it, you know, and you just expand this horizon until you can't go any further. That will your 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 component one. Then you go pick another node, do the very same thing, and then you label them one at a time. Except that in MapReduce, you could really simulate that, except that in MapReduce, you have to, you cannot do one at a time type of labeling. You would start from every single node as if it was its own connected component, and at some point, these, these, and then you start growing it, and at some point, they would clash, and you have to reconcile them. Um, that would be the main basic idea, I mean, straightforward way to do it. But the minhash trick is that, uh, so the problem that with that is that you have to carry this massive growing frontier and then merge them together. But it really turns out, you know, with really like a minhash idea trick, you don't really have, you, you keep the hash of that frontier, which you, when they clash, you will know they clashed. Um, that would be the gist of the trick. So um, in the beginning you said you're already switching to sparse matrix representation. Uh -huh. Is there any scenario that you can envision that you want to keep it as a connected matrix as opposed to a sparse matrix? And B, related to that, is there any uh, pre-processing schemes like the ones you men mentioned up front by ordering right, right. that can be applied to any of these? Um, any, any of which ones? Like, like the ones you did where you just uh, the, the, the lowest degree and then yeah, yeah. And that way, so. so you're saying whether there are anything of that nature for, for not sparse for a dense graph? Yeah, first the data structure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm constantly going to just use the sure. sparse matrix sure. representation sure. across the board. Sure. Yes, no? Well, I mean, for what I do, I, I, I rarely kind of kind of have a full, full graph of anything. Unless, like, when I process them, at times I'll end up with a, with a denser graph. But my starting point, but it's just me. I mean, uh, to be honest, to say that there's no such thing, I don't know. Um, I mean, there, there must be. <laughs> but, um, but at least the ones I more see, and also, frankly, I'm more interested in our, uh, our sparser graphs. So, so answer, I don't know. OK, and um, the, uh, for all these advanced ones, can you apply any of the pre-processing schemes from up front? Sort by degree, that kind of thing. To, to even even yeah. make it, yeah, exactly. So so yeah. So the common thing that I learned um, early on is that high degree nodes are trouble, even when you find one even label graphs, right? To just an example of the pre-processing that I always do, even to label label the connected components, I remove all the really high degree nodes, I label them and I then put them back, right? Because it, it's gonna it's gonna cut down. And there's some really good math behind why it would work. And then you can model that if, if you assume your graph is, is reasonably random. 
But a bunch of things I always do is, is just, just think and look at the graph, get a sense of what the degree distribution is, get a sense of how connected it is. Then you could do different things, right? A very po you know, popular trick I do is, is just remove the, the trouble people, then put them back. I mean, they're not going to. Because as the zones grow and then they clash, if you have a really high degree node, those are going to cause, cause more problem. You don't have to. You could deal with them basically separately. But, but like anything you do in data mining, right? I mean, it's just probably a good portion of my job is to just look at the graph, get a sense of like, what is this, right? I mean, uh, a lot of times you can tell, tell that you can do a few. But my hope is that with this package that we're building, that some of those things come, would come naturally, the things that we've learned through the years. Little art, little science. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But yeah, yeah. And always, you could put so much of it there, but uh, as a, as a, as a formula, there's some, uh, but then at times you gotta have a feeling for what you're doing. Yeah, yes, yes. So this yes. question is less technical. Yeah. But how you work in, into it? What kind of questions are you trying to answer by using these graph uh, yeah. mining algorithms? Sure. So I'll, I'll, I have a couple of slides for those, but just very, very few. But but basically, uh, it's not very different from from. I mean, it's a social network anyway, but except that the nodes are businesses. So the types of problems I try to answer is that. If you have a business in Palo Alto selling something, who are the cl 10 closest businesses to you? Or who are the 20 vendors that you should be aware of? It's like people you may know. For us, it's people you may want to know. Uh, it's like, uh, should you know these vendors or, or these clients you may be interested in? And a lot of it actually falls from the graph structure. I know people who, uh, like, like think of a bunch of vendors, and then I'm a, I'm a node, I buy things from these vendors. Right? And then there's another node uh, who's also buying things from those vendors. So him and I probably are in the same business. So if there's a vendor that I work with and he doesn't, we'll, we'll make an offer. So that's the type of thing we're trying to, the type of graph mining. But very much think about it, I mean, it's, it's, it's a commercial social graph, really, right? Um, and that's, that's also where it's exciting. The links are not I like you and like me, not that there's anything wrong with that, but links are somebody actually paid money to someone else. So, so there's a little bit more love there than, than <laughs> Yes? So this one, um, this, the, the, the sort of a... For the triangle count of example, how many versions? So the, the, the toy example we use to work with is about 200 million nodes. About 10 billion edges. So you, you can buy a single machine that will represent, uh, yeah. on which you can represent that graph and make Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yes, yes, you could. <laughs> yeah, that's what we do. Too. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, so like Casabari from uh, from Twitter is, we'll push it on all the way. But it's uh, but the thing is that's that's my toy. Right. It's not really. We're basically building this graph, and it's going to be it's going to be a lot bigger. Because it's not just necessarily the businesses, and all sorts of interactions there would be um, would be part of that. For instance, I send you an email. Email would be a note. I would be just think about again, right? Think how where, where Facebook is going with that. Uh, and part of these is that I'm not really trying to solve a today's problem. They're not into it necessarily, although we we do. But it's basically we're gearing up for what's going to happen as the commercial graph is basically. But I agree with you. I mean, how, you how, how big do you expect it to be eventually? I don't know. Yeah. But there, part of it is also intellectual curiosity. I mean, I know. I just enjoy doing these things. And lucky enough, someone pays for it. <laughs> but you're right. I mean, Castlebarry, I do, do it all the time. As a matter of fact, even for the bigger problems, I do map produce jobs until it fits into memory. And then, so you don't have to kind of, like, Labeling connected components, you don't have to take it all the way to the bitter end as a map reduce job. You could start labeling things, labeling things, basically shrinking the graph until it fits in the memory and then you just run it. The phenomenon that I, that I sort of have a knee jerk reaction against is people using map reduce for problems where you can do everything in main memory. No, absolutely. Yeah. No, no, I come from a startup. I used to, whatever works, I mean, that's, uh, that's fine. The thing is, um, partly I know I know we're, we're going to need this. Uh, partly even now, a bunch of things. Um, it's easier to just do it, do it in theory. But I'm not like saying that. Like I said, I mean, for the most part, a lot of things I'll 
I wouldn't <laughs> take you to the bitter end on the, on the map readers. Like labeling connected components. There comes a point where you just dump it in the memory and keep doing the labeling. <coughs> Did you also try the graph or graph lab thing? Mm -hmm. I think they started in 2007. So I don't know. Repeat the question. So uh, did I use uh, try giraffe and graph lab? Right. So I mean I've worked with giraffe. Uh, I mean I kind of I don't know if I'll be offending anyone, but I'll wait a little bit more before I kind of kind of do do anything. Uh, you know, just just take the next step. But but I'm always you know there are a lot of these things by the way. Uh, even though I put it in in terms of a map reduce thing. I mean, these are really ways of thinking. You could do the same thing on, as a SQL, for God's sake, right? I mean, we've got these Matiza boxes, which is another thing you get to play with uh, when you join a big company. But you could write uh, SQL jobs that does the same thing. There's nothing really particular about MapReduce. It's how you think about the algorithm. And a lot of these things, like labeling connected components, uh, there is a version of it for a batch sync type of thing, like Giraffe. Or, um, so a lot of the thinking would still carry over. Not all of it. Uh, but a lot of it would still carry over, I'd say. Yeah. I think I've seen some arguments that some uh, paradigms or platforms are more appropriate to certain kinds of problems right. than, and MapReduce has, it in particular, has been singled out as something that is maybe not the, uh, the not, not the best for, 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 for iterative things. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, there's nothing particularly, what to me is like it's there, and it's uh, it's it's kind of kind of well established. But have you seen any classes of problems that you think might be better suited to something like Graph Lab or, or some other way of? It's like community finding, for instance, right? I mean, to find a community um, community at real real scale with MapReduce is, I mean, a good one is 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 a hassle, right? But when you start thinking in terms of uh, in terms of a batch sync process, all of a sudden it's a it's a lot more natural, right? I totally agree with you. I mean, a lot. There's a lot of things that um, that are they're just not meant. This is not meant to do those things, probably. So we're kind of pushing it a little bit. But again, a lot of thinking still carries on um, because it's basically from the field of streaming theory, right, and all sorts of good stuff. So so it never hurts to to think about what we're doing. Now the other thing is whether someone like me would spend some time and um, writing a package to do these things. So that to me occurred to me like I'm writing these things for the third time in three companies. So, so I would at least for my own benefit think that it's something that people could use. So. Is this package that you've been talking about an open source thing? That so yeah, hopefully, yeah. And that's probably the way, uh, I mean, if I get indication that people are interested. So it, it's going to be in cascading. It would be based on cascading. You would implement the, the usual, you know, the things that at least starting from what we care about it into it. but. Uh, but hopefully people will like it and, uh, and contribute. So promises that it will be open source, but, um, but I don't think it's finalized yet. Um, so I call it Graph Edge for now. So, sorry, uh, yeah. did you already say how this compared to Graph Lab? Or? Sorry, uh, Graph Lab I don't know much about. I apologize. I should. There's a <laughs> workshop coming up. Okay. Sure. Now I'll look forward to it. Sure. Yes. So uh, right now, if you, if you have to choose a graph processing uh, framework on the new startup, which one? You see, it really, it really again depends on. Um, I mean, since we assume that this is not open source, so then which one would you choose? If this was not a so, so as a matter of fact, my, my startup was heavily on graph processing. You heavily used um, um, uh, graph processing. I did uh, it. was like a, it was a learning. So the gist of it was a learning algorithm on a on a visual textual bipartite graph. So it, it was it was like a huge bipartite graph with visual features and textual features, and there was like a the learning was like um, some sort of a belief propagation type of thing. It was very convenient to do it on MapReduce and Amazon. So we just say, you know, I want 200 machines, right? No, 300, right? 
So it was really convenient. Um, now, I really don't know, I think, um, enough to answer that. So I would still probably, in this part of it, because that's my, that's the stuff I know how to do. But for the most part, I use Cassavari for, uh, from Twitter for most of the things, unless it gets kind of out of hand and you really need to. Two questions. <coughs> the first question is, the hardware is already working on similar product. Um, they're going to mix with the... Sorry, say, say, can you repeat that? The hardware works, who is okay. working on the Hadoop. Okay. They are planning to re uh, release a version okay. which contains a job similar to this. Well, that's great, yeah. So yeah. that means like, you are not working with them. Uh, no, I'm not working. Your work is not going to be part of them. No, not, not as far as I know. Again, right, we also have very specific use cases we need to solve for. Okay. For instance, graph clustering is what we're super interested in. Like um, like graph community finding, by the way, is, is another thing. So you want to have communities of businesses. So those are the ones I'm, but if, if something happens, then some, well, it's always good. That's how things move forward. No, no regrets there, really. Yeah. Uh, once uh, working from internet, Ah, okay. He was mentioning that you are using Neo for you. Yeah. So, uh, like, how do you compare? Uh, yeah, I, I did not work with that. I know we're we're not really happy, but it's like a database, though, right? I mean, it's yeah. like it really doesn't. So far as I remember, just you really want to do something scalable at scale. At least the ones I saw did not seem to be doing the job. But um, but again, I usually offend someone. It's a small <laughs> town. <laughs> <it's like. laughs> a little controversy is a good thing. Right. <laughs> yes. Um, if you have you looked at the approximate solution, there's no penalty for really getting a wrong answer. Actually, there's some really good, good works on those um, for a bunch of things like uh, maximum vertex cover stuff like that. So this, so I try to put put a bunch of works there. If you read this one, so there are some really good ones on how you would do, and it, people are, are kind of now realizing it's okay. I think a lot, a lot of known okay. approximation tricks can now be uh, be moved. It's a lot of NP hard stuff that we we had good approximations for. Now, now people are thinking how to, to bring them in. Um, yes, there's there's actually quite a few of those. Yes. Yes. Uh, I believe there are iterations in the wrong. I uh, you know if you use the lot of right. which will be very low. Right. So how do you handle that? Yeah. No, if you slow, that's why you want to minimize okay. uh, minimize the number of map reduce jobs that, that you do. Uh, like there was a stitching idea is essentially I don't want to I don't I don't want I mean the total amount of computation is the same, but I just don't want to go back and forth, back and forth every every walk of the random walk. I don't want to do one whole map reduce job. That was exactly the the reason for for not doing that. Well, thank you very much. You guys are very good.